Um, <coughs> thank you, everybody, and thank you, Gary, for inviting us. Um, I'll, I'll make a start. Okay, um, that's it. We are the Randall Computation with Design Team, um, and our presentation is called The Practical Implementation of Natural Principles from Render to Reality. Um, I first just explain who, who Ramble are. Ramble are a very big Danish consultancy of, it says 10,000 employees, it's more like 13,000 employees, it offices across the world, uh, and we work for Ramble UK, doing all sorts of engineering. Um, and Ramble's uh, sort of recent track record, we're working on the uh, Tate Modern 2, we've heard something more of, we worked on Oslo Opera House, Snow Heta, um, at the Hepworth Gallery, top right, with Chipfield. Um, we're also working on the City Life Towers in Milan with people like Zaha's, uh, Isazaki, and um, Lipsky. Um, but uh, Harry and I belong to a small team in Ramble called the, the Computation Design Team, or RCD. Uh, and, and we were set up because we felt that conventional engineering <coughs> assumptions uh, were not enough. We want to challenge conventional engineering. Um, and we want to develop and apply digital tools to help us optimize structures. Um, and the, but the reality is we're not just interested in technology for the sake of technology. We're just as interested in uh, the making, the building, the practical reality. And we found that it's the practical reality which often influences our designs. Uh, a, a brief snapshot of some of the projects we've been involved with. We have flakes balls to carbon fiber. Uh, rod uh, sculptures, and uh, we'll, we'll show you some of these in detail um, later on. Um, timber shells, um, pavilions <coughs> with folded plate, uh, tracks and weave um, installation structures. And go back to the beginning. Um, engineers have traditionally fought in very straight lines, they're very straight line people um, triangles, beams, trusses. Uh, but the, the aerospace industry and the car industry has made huge progress, um, initially in terms of modeling um, complex forms, but now actually analyze and refine complex forms. And then so we aim to build on that, but we're also taking ideas from the, uh, the computer game industry, for example, how to break down surfaces into rational elements. Um, you know, Gaudi did it over 100 years ago, uh, and physical models, and physical models mimicking natural forms, where well, we can actually code those now into our own digital tools. Uh, we look at uh, how nature organizes itself, both in terms of patterns, and again, efficient uh, structures. This is a uh, slime mold. It shows how slime molds can grow and mimic uh, city layouts, for example, or metro station layouts. Um, a particularly fruitful area for us is to use literally the laws of genetics and survival of the fittest to take our structures, rearrange them, um, uh, and then pick the most, uh, the best solution. Using the laws of electromagnetics, for example, to set up structures. We'll show you this uh, in a bit. And I think um, is it you? So we haven't practiced this. <laughs> I'll do the first okay, bit. Um, uh, so, so where we started was probably the whole field of generative modeling. There's a big buzz phrase in the architecture industry, which is parametricism, um, which we hate, by the way. Um, so well, we started doing that using parametric modeling. Um, this is a project we did with Zaha Hadid architects, uh, setting up these, these trusses. Uh, and they all set out in relation to the, the curved surface of the facade. So every time the architect changed the, the curved surface, um, we will automatically um, change the trusses, their, their, their size, depth, centers, etc. Uh, and we were lucky because um, the architect changed a lot. Um, so that, that, that was great. I mean, it's, in a sense, it's sort of dumb uh, parametric modeling. Uh, it just shows you where, where you traditionally have a CAD drawing. Now, this is your CAD drawing. So the elements of the model are set out as a script. So we can change any part of it, it will automatically update the final model. Uh, and this is one of the uh, uh, examples we'll show you later of a, a pavilion where we did, which we did, where you can change the, the surface itself, you can change the position of the joints, the number of the joints, 
you know, just by just by typing a number and the whole thing will regenerate. It would have been impossible five years ago. Um, I think this is Harry's bit, but I think where we're trying to do now is to say, well, this is fine, but we like to weave in uh, codes and routines and ideas that, as I said, optimize the structure itself, not just the geometry. Harry? Okay, firstly, sorry that I'm looking so scruffy. Steve was wearing a t shirt. <laughs> so, okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the ideas is that hopefully as engineers where we really want to get involved in the project is kind of early on where we can make a really positive difference uh, and also we can kind of take some more ownership of a project and kind of feel that we've made a real difference. Uh, these are the traditional uh, REBA stages. Um, engineers often come in, we might have a light touch during the concept design and design development. Uh, and a lot of our work is done during uh, technical design. But we really want to get there earlier in the design brief to kind of help our, um, architects, but also clients, and also the fabricators, make all these other stages which come along later a lot more straightforward. Uh, particularly the construction stage. I also work about a few ways we can just do this. Um, so one of our tools uh, is called dynamic relaxation. Um, so this is based on the form finding tools which Gaudi used many years ago. Um, the main advantage of taking that from the physical form finding model into the computer, uh, firstly, it's Gaudi and Isla used to make these models and they used to have to measure every point of their structure. Um, Isla was really, uh, Isla, sorry, was really obsessed with it. He used to measure every point five times and record it. Um, this is for every single ch uh, hanging chain model. Uh, these models were really big, they were quite expensive, uh, you, this is, um, and to do different iterations it became quite a long, tedious process. Um, so here's uh, a piece of software we wrote a few years ago. Um, you can see that it happens in real time, and not only can you only use gravity, you could apply kind of horizontal forces, you could apply uh, interesting wind loading patterns and get out these geometries. And again, you can just simply export these points directly to a CAD model or to uh, computer aided manufacturing. Uh, another concept, this is a, that's a concept we've used time and again to create quite efficient uh, compression structures. Uh, another thing we've looked at a few times is something called principal curvature fields. Uh, so if you have a surface which you've created in uh, your CAD program, um, or any mathematical surface, if you take a point on that surface, there are two lines of curvature, uh, or two principal curvature lines which you're interested in, and these are simply the maximum and minimum curvatures. Um, it's not uh, all that scary. And here are some principal curvature lines on this structure. You can see it's actually curving quite a lot around the cylinder, and then the minimum curvature is that kind of horizontal lines we show. Uh, and there's some really interesting uh, designs you can take using these uh, lines. So here's an example of something uh, which is very bad for construction. Uh, these are some elements meeting at a node. Um, and more often than not, if you have a number of elements meeting in a node, it's very unlikely that they're going to be perfectly aligned, uh, especially if they're following some kind of freeform surface. Uh, so you, there's two options, you either twist the members, or you have to have quite complex uh, connection details. And this is something which adds a lot of cost, uh, and visually it's kind of unattractive for the structure. Uh, so here's an example of a, a good node detail on the top left. All the members align perfectly, connection details can be repeated. And these are the kind of areas we're interested in as engineers, where we can kind of solve problems. Potentially the micro detail, where we get quite obsessive about tiny little neat details. Uh, and we'll talk about the project uh, Creod, where we use this, and also um, where we tested out initially on Creod, and then another project uh, of grid shell foyer structure we did, uh, as you can see here, which is an experimental structure we did in our foyer in London. Uh, to kind of prove a number of concepts, and including fabrication. I think I've got a, this is a little zoomed in detail of the node, and you can see it actually aligns very nicely. Uh, and all the pieces could just be simply laser cut from flat sheets um, to make this kind of nice uh, curved structure. And this, the shape of this structure is also found using form finding uh, software. Uh, and then here's a scheme where we use, oh, sorry, another advantage of this, using these principal lines of principal curvature, is every panel, um, apart from around a, 
Okay, the next point will be um, there's only four members leaving each uh, node, which is relatively few. A triangular grid would have six. Um, and the other really amazing advantage is that every one of these panels is completely flat. So when you're working with glass or timber, uh, you're saving potentially a factor of you know, about 0.1 of the price, potentially, of uh, having curved or milled uh, panels. Uh, another, so this kind of idea of using flat panels and cleaning connection joints is something we kind of run throughout our projects. Uh, another thing, TPI mesh, uh, which we're going to talk about. Uh, this is tangent plane intersection. Uh, this was from the animation industry. We found some research and we applied it to the building industry. Uh, very simply, we'll talk about this a bit later, but very simply you get a complicated mesh made of thousands of triangles. Uh, the, yeah, the algorithm will run. Um, and you decide how many panels you want to recreate your complex shape in. And on the right, you can see this is made up of completely flat panels. So again, glass panels are really cheap. Uh, plywood becomes uh, usable. Sheet metals become usable. Uh, and there's some interesting structural properties as well. We can talk about. <coughs> okay. Um, just a few more tools to sort of set the um, scene up. Next one called principal stress. Um, and this isn't a new idea, this is um, Pierre Luigi Nerdy, who was a great engineer from the 1950s. And he realized that if you had a concrete slab, for example, not every part of the concrete slab is working hard. Um, you could take the material away from it, you could put material where it was most needed to redistribute um, what you have. And this is a, sort of a great example. Uh, he guessed, he didn't have power of the computer, but he's a very, very good guess. Um, so, <coughs> We've now um, set this up, we have our own programs which do this. So taking one example of a, a reinforced concrete slab on the left, a uh, very basic, completely flat um, ceiling. Um, if we then trace the principal stress, line, principal stress lines uh, by putting in material along those lines and taking material away where it's not needed, we end up with this slab, this very, I suppose, petal-like um, form, which most people at this point in the presentation say, well, how do you build it? But we're talking to people from various universities about inflatable formwork, fabric formwork. So we think, we think this can be built. But the interesting thing is to look at the embodied energy in the, uh, I keep saying the optimized solution, but the refined solution, it's about 20% less than the conventional building, which is, which is a huge amount. You imagine a big, complex concrete building. You've saved that everywhere. You've saved a lot of energy. Um, and then building on the similar sort of principle, topological optimization. Um, and there's various strands to this. Uh, one of the first is what's called genetic algorithm. I've got the image of DNA up before and talked about survival of the fittest and evolution. Well, this is literally the code behind it applied to uh, the manipulation of the structure. Uh, and in this case, this was a, a warehouse that we designed for a big wind turbine manufacturer. And it's very conventional triangulated trusses. Um, and then we were allowed to come along after they built it, unfortunately. And we said, right, if we can use our ideas and rearrange that triangulated truss using the same material, the same size sections, which just moved to a different location, what happens? Well, um, if you look at the before and the after, um, the deflection at the center of the truss before was 23 millimeters. And after we rearranged it, it's six. So in reality, um, you know, we could say, well, that's a fourfold decrease in the amount of material that we need. Structures don't work quite like that. There are other things which come into play. But you could get something like, we think, uh, a 40% decrease in the amount of steel in that truss. And the next question everyone says is, well, that's much more complicated to build. But we've been talking to the steel contractors in the UK, and their view is that if it's a two-dimensional truss like this, it's no more complicated than the basic triangulated one, because everything is set out by a computer. Everything is, the steel is chopped by a computer, everything is set out by a computer. Um, so we think this has huge potential, and we've used this on uh, a few projects recently. And a similar routine, uh, this is, um, don't push it. So there's, there's less intelligence behind this, but it's simply saying if we take a frame structure and we move elements of that frame structure from uh, where they aren't working very hard to areas that they are working hard, 
it will redistribute itself to uh, an efficient pool. And to test it, top left is just a, a, a very simple uh, truss. We will allow the members to rearrange to bottom right, or they're rearranged through a tied arch without us even intervening. So, and again, it's, there's great potential to for this. Uh, and we tested it on a, a live project. This was the Presidential Library in Astana, uh, Kazakhstan, where the facade was uh, a very regular grid. But it was a very regular grid, and it's a very complicated structure. Now, if you apply our routine to that structure, rearranging it, well, it looks complicated. It's a two-dimensional structure, so it's actually relatively easy to fabricate. But the main thing was you could reduce the amount of steel in this massive building with you know, huge amounts of um, material by 15 to 20%. So suddenly a, I shouldn't tell you, it's 50 million pound package. If you could reduce the steel by 15%, that's actually a lot in terms of money. Um, all right, Harry, you're going to pick up the next few. Okay, so... Um, this is kind of similar uh, from a structural, sorry, from a software perspective. It's the um, digital dynamic relaxation. Uh, rather than having springs, uh, we just simply have nodes on the surface which just push away from all the other nodes on the surface. Uh, and these are really nice for kind of generating uh, facade arrangements. Um, so what we've done on top left is there's lots of points on this surface and they'll they all just push away from each other um, and you let this run and as you, you get extremely close to these quite regular uh, grids as you can see on the bottom right so you would never use this on a rectangle but this is a kind of proof of concept to see how close you can get to it um, and the other advantage here is that almost every length of the material will be exactly the same uh, and most of those triangles will be uh, the same dimensions uh, and then again, we apply this to the uh, residential library in Astana. Uh, this is another kind of use of node repulsion. So I'm going to play this. Uh, so there's an architect who wanted well distributed but random columns in their space. Uh, so what we're doing is we are interactively throwing nodes into our space, which we programmed, uh, and they're all pushing away from each other. And you can see you get this quite even space. Um, with the kind of random element which the architect wanted to see, and with the logic, so we, we make sure that we don't have spans which are too large. Uh, and we gave this piece of software to the architect to kind of play around with, which is always fun. Uh, so this is some research I did uh, whilst I was at Bath University. Um, there's often an idea that engineers come in and change the shape of the structure to make it more efficient. Um, but often it's, it's either too late, or you can't do this because maybe it's a sculpture, and you couldn't say to the artist, can you kind of make the nodes move to the left? Or can you like, have an arm in a different position because they'll say, no, this is exactly how it must be. Uh, or maybe you have existing structures and you can't move them. So this is my idea about, okay, you have a rigid volume. What's the best we can do within that? Uh, so again, using particles. Uh, this is the volume which I import. Uh, and then I throw lots of particles within this volume. Uh, the idea is it's kind of, an analogy to gas, liquids, and solids. So there's a gas phase where these just run around the volume and the high speeds with no connectivity between them. Uh, then they start to kind of cool to a liquid stage um, where they, let's run that again, it's going too fast. Uh, cool to a liquid stage where they start making connections to the adjacent uh, particles, where these connections can start uh, be created and destroyed um, while the structure still pushes out further. And the connectivity pattern is based on something called Delaunay uh, tetrahedralization, which means that every uh, bit of geometry in here is a tetrahedron, which means that it's actually very similar to a space frame. So what we're doing here is generating a space frame, which really fills the volume. And by filling a volume structurally, we're using the maximum amount of depth. Uh, so we think it's actually a really, really efficient structure to fit in that kind of relatively I mean, that's actually quite a simple example of a dome, but this could be a, a sculpture or you know, any kind of shape you want. Uh, another thing we are interested in is not just structure, but um, envir environmental performance and how we can change forms to react to the environment. Uh, this was another small piece of software one of our colleagues wrote. 
Um, there were these villas uh, in Montenegro, Montenegro. Uh, and one of the ideas was they had these kind of interesting roofs, uh, but these would provide shelter during the summer, but they didn't really want these areas to be shaded during the winter. And there were, I think, 30 of these, approximately. Yeah, so uh, 40. On this hillside, all oriented in different directions, and they wanted to know how do we generate these roofs. So we did a simple, well, a small piece of software, uh, which takes a certain path of the year, uh, and then using those uh, direction vectors, created a roof which, during the summer, shaded the area, but was the minimum size to do that. So during the rest of the year, uh, you would have nice sun on the project, sorry, on the back. And then, so each one of these routes will be slightly different than the which could be a really interesting uh, form. Uh, as we mentioned before, fabrication is really important. We think this is the way to make projects actually happen. Uh, if you can make a project uh, cheaper or easy to fabricate, then that's the kind of key uh, to these projects. And the thing we always really want to do is see our projects in the real world. When that's the kind of essence of this render to reality. We're not that interested in making pretty images. We're actually quite bad at doing renders, but we really want to see these in the real world. So here's an example of a project Steve will talk about. Uh, this is the complex cuttings that we needed for uh, the elements. Uh, Steve will talk a little bit later about how those were fabricated uh, into these units, which then became a timber shell. Uh, this is part of our Trada pavilion, which I'll be talking about later. Uh, just embedding other information rather than cutting patterns, so quite traditional really, but um, having numbering systems. Uh, we kind of like this, this structure can be built with an Allen key, uh, which is quite rare. Uh, and a lot of our projects have to be demountable, which is a really interesting challenge for, for design. So it removes, you can't use glues, you can't use concrete. Uh, bolts uh, are often used. Uh, this is a, pre a project we just saw completed today. This was a render we received uh, a few months ago. Uh, and the architect had done this kind of nice design for the sculptural bench. Uh, but we noticed a few problems that the, so these kind of facade edges were curved, and that's fine, they were made of very thin pieces of timber. But these stiffening panels, which go, which create the real structure, were also curved, and this person had just designed this. Um, in the Rhino, I believe. Uh, and we kind of recognize that this is going to be a bit of a challenge to make and work with on site. So we made some really subtle changes, uh, which meant that these could all be laser cut from flat pieces. And we're really happy. I mean, it, essentially, the idea is that it looks exactly the same, but we've managed to make the underlying logic a little bit simpler and more affordable. Okay. Right, OK. Um, one of the advantages of having a, a small team and a big organisation is we get a research grant. Um, so, simplistically, it means we can spend money on um, um, projects which aren't actual projects. <coughs> so, um, give you a, sort of a brief taste of some of the things that we're doing. Harry's mentioned TPI mesh, principal curvature, uh, electrical repulsion. So, one of our research projects is to apply that to a real building. Um, and this is a building which we worked on with <coughs> Zaha Reed Architects. Um, it's in Abu Dhabi. It wasn't built because it was a victim of the 2008 uh, world economic collapse. But it's a very interesting double curved surface. Um, so we applied all those techniques to the surface. We're now in the process of getting hard data of what that means in terms of cost, number of panels, uh, program, etc. <coughs> but also just, just, just the visual appearance. I mean, each one has its unique aesthetic. Uh, that's ongoing, uh, and a, a project which we're, we're very excited about is, um, again, this is a snapshot of the development models uh, of a tower in Copenhagen that we're working on with uh, big architects in Copenhagen, and, and, and every time they have a different idea, there's a different foam model, and one of, the, one of our well, joint ideas was, you know, how, do you, how can you do this in digital form that will give you feedback straight away into how that particular building is, is performing. So you can, you can try different shapes. Um, but, um, and this is cutting edge research. And we talked about parametric modeling. <clears throat> so parametric modeling, you can then shape a building by just changing some parameters. But the parameters are all preset. It's your preconceptions which is changing the building. And this is um, parametric modeling which creates parametric models. 
<coughs> so essentially there's artificial intelligence plugged in here. So you give it some very loose parameters and it'll automatically generate parametric models and then go through them all, finding which is the best fit for a particular purpose. It could be energy consumption, height, weight, looks, whatever. And we can plug in our environmental modeling into this. And essentially what we get is a series of uh, models and then we can compare quantitative data, uh, you know, floor area, facade area, facade cost, structural cost, energy consumption, uh, with the spider diagrams on the right. And it gets completely bizarre forms, which you reject. But they give you some quite interesting feedback. Um, I think this is, the, this is probably the, the heart of, the next bit is probably the heart of our presentation, which is yeah, render to reality. Uh, I think we've picked three projects which is which bringing together a lot of these techniques that were built, and we can share some of the problems we had, uh, frankly, building them. Um, the first one was the trial at Pavilion, which Harry is massively close to, so Harry will talk about this one, and I'll talk about the two after. Okay, so TRADA is the Timber Research and Development Agency in the UK, and their role is to help people, architects, engineers, uh, manufacturers, use timber in the building industry. Uh, so people subscribe to this company, and they provide guidance, design guidance, and kind of contacts in the industry. Um, and then every year, they do a timber expo, and they like to do a kind of nice, interesting structure to show what can be done with timber. So they'd seen our foyer sculpture, which I showed earlier, the one with the kind of flat connection, no details. And they asked us, which is probably the best brief we'll ever get as engineers, because usually our briefs uh, make it look exactly like it looks in this render. Uh, but this is our brief, they said, do something similar, and that's the size it needs to be, it has to be demountable, and they never said this, but we assume it has to be made up to uh, because wouldn't publicise them very well otherwise. Uh, so we kind of went away with this. Uh, probably at first we weren't really sure what to do because we were engineers. We have one architect in our team uh, who guides us when we make crazy decisions. Uh, so one of the ideas, well here is using our dynamic relaxation software we created. Um, we could quite interactively try a lot of different ideas. Uh, we're interested in showing kind of curvy structures if possible. Um, and we wanted to create a kind of close, well, like a kind of enclosed environment in this expo. Uh, this is just someone playing around with it. Um, I think it explodes in a second. Okay, so we kind of generated this interesting form, but what we have here is extremely complicated. It's not going to be very easy to have it. It's completely curved. I mean, maybe someone could. Uh, sculpt it from a huge lump of timber. Uh, but that's not very demountable and it's not very affordable. Um, and it's not very cheap and it's not very clever either. So we thought, let's see what we can do. Uh, some of the cheapest wood you can buy is plywood, completely flat sheets. Um, and because this was a kind of a small project, to kind of justify us doing it, we need to get something out of it. So we kind of set ourselves some challenges. Uh, and one was we're going to create this from completely flat panels. Um, so, the first step was to just divide it quite easily into triangles. Uh, you can recreate any surface quite closely with triangles. Uh, it's quite common, that's why this is the reason you see a lot of triangular facades. Um, but again, this doesn't really justify us spending time on it in terms of research. Um, we actually think there are some really bad structural issues, which really would have been a problem if we'd built this. Uh, as you see, as you go up one of the legs, there's kind of this continuous line between panels, and we think this would have kind of buckled quite easily. So the only way to resist that would have had uh, would to have had quite strong fixed connections between the panels. Um, yes, this is just showing the. You can imagine how wobbly this would be, and how each panel, as it can move around independently, you could, if those were solid steel, you could probably bend them quite easily using the lever arm on the timber panels. So again, we're kind of looking at better ways to divide the surface. Uh, nature doesn't really do triangular panels very often. Uh, this is usually because of the way the panels grow. Uh, they'll grow from a small central point and then they'll just grow to meet their neighbours. Uh, and that will generally create, it's called a Voronoi diagram, which is kind of hated in architecture or digital architecture at the moment. 
because it's kind of relatively easy to, to recreate. But there are some really useful elements of it. So I showed this slide earlier. This is the um, breaking down of a very high resolution mesh into flat panels. Um, so we, we, we contacted uh, the people who wrote this paper, uh, who had developed some algorithms to break down the uh, high resolution triangular meshes into flat panels. Uh, we got no response uh, until we finished the project, and then they said, oh, great. That's kind of cool. Um, so then we had to remake the software and algorithms ourselves. Uh, so this is using Rhino and Grasshopper. And one of the really nice things about it is that if it doesn't do something you need it to do, you can create your own component, and then it can suddenly do that thing you needed it to do. Uh, so this is the algorithm that's run. Um, you can see the kind of wireframe of the structure it's created. Uh, and this really shows how close uh, the final flat panels are to the original surface. It's intersecting every single face. Um, and now I believe it's made out of 30 panels rather than, I think it was over 3,000 before. And then in a second, we hide the original mesh. OK, you can kind of, again, it's kind of an irregular aesthetic. Uh, it all depends on the local curvature of the uh, high resolution mesh. But we, so we knew that this was going to be much cheaper to build. And here's this uh, algorithm applied to our uh, original triangular mesh. So the other challenge was how do we connect these panels together? Uh, previously, when it was triangular, we needed rigid connections. But now, because of this arrangement of hexagonal panels, if you imagine the plates at the top right, perhaps, uh, they, they lock each other together. There's only there's three panels around each node. Uh, so once they're all connected, they become very rigid. So once we knew we didn't need any kind of sizable connections, one thing we did need is a connection detail that can fit any angle, because the angles between all the panels are different. Um, and they just needed to resist shear forces between the panels. Uh, we came up with a few different ideas. You can see the idea of kind of interlocking sections. But then we had a bit of a kind of eureka moment. Uh, and realize that hinges do just that. They can rotate to any angle. And this means on site, you don't have this connection goes there, that connection goes there. You just have a thousand hinges on the floor. The people building it just grab a hinge and fit it, fit it straight into the structure. Uh, hinges are obviously very cheap. Um, some people go either way, really, on the aesthetic of the hinge. But uh, it's kind of obvious, right? This is being held together. These can rotate independently. And you can really see the final structure holding together. Uh, this is an example of high-tech engineering testing. Uh, we went slightly outside of the Eurocode guidance of where you can put in uh, bolts to the edges. Um, yeah, and this is our, probably our heaviest guy in the Bristol office, uh, standing on it. And we did the board in two directions, that it was more than enough, which is kind of fun. Uh, we got one of our interns to build a scale model. And what we really like about this is that this model is working exactly the same as the final structure. So we had little tabs of plastic, which actually hinged elements. Um, and we would prod it and take this to meetings and kind of convince ourselves that it would actually stand up. Um, there's a little detail you might have spotted. Uh, around the edges, there's these returned um, stiffener panels, we call them. And that's actually because this whole idea of a rigid structure falls down where you have a boundary. So we had to add these onto the edges. And these were actually glued to the uh, edge panels. Uh, so again, to prove that it does actually stand together, this hinges, we created a prototype. Uh, prototyping is something we do as much as possible. Uh, it's kind of fun. This is on a balcony in the London office. Um, gets us away from our desks, which we enjoy. Um, and again, proves exactly what. Proving a few things. So proving the fabricational uh, fabrication steps, proving the assembly sequences, and then finally proving the structural concepts. And again, showing you can put it together pretty easily. Uh, this is the same intern as before. We uh, gave her a honey key this time. Uh, another just quick detail again, this parameter uh, again can be used to do detailing. So the uh, edges, as you can see here, um, all the caps and the hinges and the bolts were uh, applied parametrically. So these are the stiffener hinges uh, I discussed. Uh, these are the only glue panels in the project. And you can sort of kind of flat back this despite these edges. Um, we really like the kind of light effects you get here. Uh, you can see the shadow of each hinge from this view. Um, 
And it was amazingly stiff because the form was found. It's a purely compression shell. Um, so we were kind of hanging off the structure. This is that's me in the middle. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to be really happy with this kind of idea, definitely showing a new thing you can do with timber. And it's an extremely affordable uh, structure. Another project which uh, embodies one of our work, this, this is the Creole project. Uh, it's actually cited by the Millennium Dome in London, if those of you know London. Um, and the story goes that the architect originally came to us this vision of this portable arts exhibition cultural centre. His original uh, scheme was this very quadrilateral um, four-sided <coughs> grid. And we talked about the lines of principal curvature and things not meeting in notes, etc. Then we said to him, the problem with this, with this, it won't work. You won't be able to fabricate it in the way you think it, you think you can. Because at the notes, these members won't meet. It's going to be extremely complicated, extremely costly to produce the connections. So we thought about the lines of principal curvature. <clears throat> he was happy for us to explore that. We took his original surface and we divided the, the surface into the lines of uh, principal curvature, and then we put a structure to it, and we'll come back to that. And at this point, I think we have to be honest and say it was a pretty poor structure. Actually, it performed pretty badly, um, and that was because, to be honest, we were given the surface. So the surface we were given didn't really have the inherent structural efficiency. It wasn't doubly curved sufficiently. It was, it was quite a quite a loose surface. So we said to the architect, well, wouldn't it be good if we could use our ideas of lines of principal curvature and deform the surface so you still get the, the look, the, the appearance you want, the aesthetic you want, uh, but we can make it more structurally efficient. So again, we wrote a program where the, the architect could actually deform the geometry within the boundaries to make it more efficient. Uh, and then we apply the lines of principal curvature. Uh, and we put a structure to it and analysed it, and it was great. I think the, uh, the level of stress in the members was reduced by a factor of four. It was, it was fantastic. And then the project died. <coughs> the architect was funding it himself. Uh, he's a very brave architect. Um, and he had run out of money. And I'm not really sure the, 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 the full story, but the project died. And we thought it had gone away until he came back to us probably a year and a half ago and said, I've got a new idea. It's the same surface as before, but we want to divide it into hexagons. And I'm not sure what his motivation was for the hexagons, but he was really insisting it must be hexagons. Um, and to be fair, he enlisted the help of an Austrian geometry company called Eva Loops to actually break down the surface into hexagons for him, which annoyed us because we could it just as easily. <clears throat> but being engineers, I think the point here is we've shown you lots of examples of digital technology uh, I don't want it to be seen or if you, you to think that we're somehow obsessed with all things computers. We probably spend as much time sketching and uh, coming up with ideas and having rows about how, how joints um, would look as we do actually modelling. So we broke down the uh, hexagonal surface and we came to the conclusion actually this is a very difficult thing to build because hexagonal patterns you know, aren't the most efficient um, and the joints would be quite complicated and costly again. And we said to him, well, look, you realise that every single connection would be different, and every single connection um, is going to be quite strong. And what he wanted this aesthetic of a piece of furniture. He didn't want to see the connections. He didn't want big bolted connections. Uh, it, it had to be demountable. It had to be built by I think only uh, a small gang of unskilled people, um, and it had to be cheap. So he had no idea of a, a plastic or a, a timber joint, which. Um, was glued. We said it's glued. You can't demount it. It's not demountable structure. Um, and then you had this idea of extruded plastic connections. And we said, well, okay, but every single connection would be different. It's going to cost a fortune. And then there was this sort of bizarre interlocking one. And we said, well, how do you fabricate this? And I think the eureka moment was probably uh, on the right. And we were talking with so a kind couple of ideas of joints. And so. An idea in um, this Japanese architecture and pre-Second World War German architecture, how to make a joint with a minimum possible material, which is a reciprocal connection. So it's each of the three members comes together in a pattern, 
Well, there's very few joints. You can do very, very simple and small bolts. Um, and then, um, frankly, we stole the idea of how the bolts go into the end of the timbers from uh, my son's high chair. Uh, but we, we weren't telling anybody that. Um, and it, it worked quite well, and we were quite happy with that. Uh, we did a lot, lots of work modeling the joints. There's a very simple connection here, just a bolt which goes into the end of the timber, which is then restrained by a small cross dowel connector. So each of these connections could be bought for you know, two pounds from you know, a hardware shop, rather than 200 pounds from a steel fabricator. Uh, and then we took it to the timber fabricator, and he said, no, I can't do this, this is, this is way too complicated. And he said, I've got a much better idea, we do this. And we said, well, but well, that's the same problems as the original. Every single steel angle is going to be different. It's not a piece of furniture. It's a very visible connection. Um, can we go away and think of something else? So we spent ages thinking of different connections and how we could get the same um, uh, advantages of a reciprocal connection. We were looking at tubes bolted to it. We were looking at all sorts of things. And eventually we came to the conclusion, actually, no, we like our connection. And we said to him, well, why can't you do it? He said, I don't have the tool to cut the piece of timber in the way it's required. And we said, well, we'll buy you the tool. So we ended up buying, well, the architect, frankly, ended up buying the tool from the fabricator to actually build these connections. Um, and because we were pushing the boundaries of uh, connections of bolts to timber, uh, we had the joints tested at a uh, university in the UK. We used the data from that to uh, analyze our structure. Now we had this image up before, uh, and each of these elements was uh, computer cut from um, the model, the, the, <coughs> the parameter model, or labeled automatically, um, and it would have been impossible to build it otherwise. There's a picture of an A cutting machine, not the one that we used. And that was brilliant. And in theory, computer control cutting is fantastically accurate. And they arrived, a whole batch of them arrived on site, and it looked like that. And the architect who paid for this was just upset, was not, was not the word. So I think he had a few um, strong words with the fabricator. And I think this many pieces of timber were wasted, because they were all cut, cut wrongly. And he, the architect's a fantastic negotiator, and he managed to persuade the fabricator to start again. Um, make some more. Um, and this time he did it right and they started building it. Here's the uh, uh, just relatively unskilled labour building this structure. And that's the finished that's the finished thing. Um, it's up for two awards at the moment in the UK, which we're really pleased about. Um, it can be moved around by hand. The inside is this PVC membrane which is double curved and stretched against the timber. I should also say uh, the timber itself is called Kebony. And it's the first example that we think anyone's used Kebony structurally. It's a reprocessed wood. It's a soft wood that they impregnate <coughs> with the waste byproducts of chemical manufacturing to make it into a hardwood, effectively like a hardwood. So it means you're not cutting down a rainforest in South America to make hardwood. You can use softwood from sustainable sources. Um, and there's a few more images. That was, that was um, Creole. And I think the last example uh, we'd like to show you in terms of making these projects real uh, is a, a sculpture that we did in New York for Christmas uh, called uh, the Belvedere sculpture. Uh, Belvedere, a vodka company. And they wanted a street concert festival um, in their name. And we were given a matter of months working with an artist, an artist called Loop PH in London, come up with a, a centerpiece of this street festival. Uh, it's in um, the Meatpacking District of New York. And their idea was um, the corporate logo of Belvedere is a tree. So they wanted trees beamed on to uh, a structure which could move. It wasn't in, supposed to be entirely rigid, it could move, it could flex, etc and then lights could go on this form. And each of these hoops was actually a carbon fiber rod, a 12 millimeter diameter carbon fiber rod. Or it had lights mounted on the uh, tree form. And then it occurred to us pretty early on that 
you know, this has to be prefabricated we can really decide if it's prefabricated means of exactly what shape these rods make when you bend one and you hold it in position. Because all the, it's very difficult to calculate that. What well, what shape is it for? Um, so we used again uh, a lot of, sort of reasonably high-end computer simulation to actually take each of these rods, mimic the bending shape. Um, and we were trying to do clever things here with the surface, so rather than just being a flat plane of rods to deform and curve it, so it has a natural strength against wind. Um, so we did a lot of that. Um, we've got a team in Denmark that has a room full of supercomputers linked up to do wind modelling. Uh, so they did wind modelling of the sculpture. They can actually mimic the wind loads, even on something, the even something with such fine detail as a 12 millimetre rod with a 40, mil 40 millimetres gap between them. So that was tremendously useful. Um, up to the point where we said to the New York authorities, right, we've proved this structure, uh, we've proved what the wind load actually is, and they said, forget it, you can design to 72 miles an hour. And we said, well, 72 miles an hour is crazy, and it's like a hurricane, and they said, yeah, we've just had a hurricane. So you all do it at 72 miles an hour. Um, and again, just to re-emphasize you know, the amount of time that we spend away from the computer as well, looking at alternatives, uh, looking at the joints, we, we spent a lot of time you know, trying to work out how these carbon and fiber rods would be connected together. Um, again, we looked at tension cables in the rods. So, you know, um, right. No one does that. <coughs> we built physical models. Uh, we were looking at clash detection. Um, what we realized is this was actually quite floppy, more floppy than a more movable than even the artist wanted. So we stiffened the whole structure up with these um, perspex ribs. But again, it had to, just perspex ribs have pre-cut holes, so it's especially important that they were accurately set out. Um, so we spent ages looking at that. We spent ages doing calculations for the new authorities. We got on site and we were given 24 hours to build it, which was quite traumatic. Uh, there's Harry, he pleased himself. There's some of the detail of the first of ribs. There's the base. Uh, there's more detail of the, the lights going on. And they were lifted in the position, and we were all really excited. And that was a, a big boat, actually. And it stood up, and everyone was quite happy. Um, there's more detail. And we finished it. We finished it you know, literally an hour before the festival started. They're doing big security guards and walking talkies basically telling them to get off the site. It was quite quite scary actually. <coughs> Some more detail about the people arriving. Now this is the I think the ABC Entertainment's correspondent in New York. And she was standing on the sculpture. I mean, we kept saying to people, don't stand on the sculpture. You're not about to stand on the sculpture. It's quite you know because it's it's quite it's not designed for that. And she was standing there, and I took the photograph, and we were all saying, if this falls over now, we'll be on YouTube forever. So, don't fall over. And here's the concert. I think we spent more time looking at the sculpture to make sure it was fine, than we did actually looking at the stage. <laughs> <laughs> and then lastly, after about an hour and a half of trying, we managed to get away into the after show party of all the celebrities. And that's it. That's the end of our presentation. Thank you very much.
find the sequence in which you can build it in order for it to be as you as you plan, right? So I'm interested a little bit on the trial of and how that was kind of yeah. I mean with the trial one I think we really froze the full funding, really. So we had that, you know, the kind of high resolution triangular mesh form. Um, and that was it, the form funding was done. We really didn't change it after that. We always knew it would be a single surface. So even if the material changed, the distribution of the kind of self weight would still be equal. So the form funding shape was still relevant. Um, so in that case, the trial was probably more simple than what we're trying to think. It can be brilliant. Where as we change it, the it's form is trying to change. And also the side conditions are kind of hard because you have this hundreds of years old project. So yeah, I think, yeah, you, well, I'd say freeze it as soon as you can. And yeah, that's probably the best advice I I think also it's worth saying that the whole idea of our team isn't, it's a bunch of artists or architects or engineers, it's actually a mixture. So it's a mixture of people who have built things, who actually know how they're going to go together, and, and people who know the maths and the, the look and the feel. I, I think you can't beat experience. You know, you, it's experience you bring to bear on the design early on. It's, it's huge, actually. And that's one of the most important things, about to second guess how these go together, or the limitations of the material, the limitations of cutting the material. So it's very, very important. I think the other kind of thing is for the trial of we were ha we had to build it. So whatever we decided, I would, knew I would be there at six months time building it. So I would make sure that the magic was going to be really easy. Same with uh, the Belvedere sculpture. So I think that's if we're made architects yeah, and engineers. Yeah. If, if, if someone said you have to build this, uh, I think people would do it a lot differently. So you don't just kick project uh, problems down the line and say, oh, the fabricators will figure that out, the engineers will figure that out. I don't know how we work on a building because the updates we're not going to want to do the concrete pouring. But if someone could maybe convince themselves that they were going to have to build it, it makes a lot of difference. I think another, another difference is somehow the depth flow. In the relationship between designers, architects, and engineers, such as yourself, which yeah. is kind of a design engineer. Because looking at examples with an Arab or, or other companies, which we had the pleasure of working with. It was quite a different process in which we are able to work parametrically and actually share models. And through the you actually bring the model in a maybe bit roughly, let's say, optimized way, which is quite interesting in, as a process of an engineer working on a parametric design. I mean, I think that helps what I was saying. So, if we are working really closely with the architect, instead of you guys just drawing the <coughs> Almost saying, well, it needs to be solved after our stage, so we can just put that problem into the, into the next step. If we are there right at the same time, then we can kind of persuade them to solve the problem now at the same time rather than delaying it. So it just really has to be. I think so. Uh, in terms of data flow, uh, it just helps that we're increasingly using the same software as our users are using. But having said that, I think it's important that we don't rely on data can just be like a text file. That can be read by any kind of software. Um, so I think it's important to understand. We'll be able to open any kind of model. We all say to everyone, because if we send us a model, whatever it is, we'll be able to open it. That's important. Yeah, I think that's Thank you for a great presentation. You argue for a simplification of a surface, a very complex surface, into flat panels. And I'm wondering if you have any experience in going to, uh, to the Z dimension of the material, because you, you always use flat panels or extruded panels. And I didn't see any panels that change with, uh, you know, with, the, with the height of the, of the pavilion, because one can argue that the strength somewhere no, the top is different from the one below, and you can change the, the, the size yeah, of the material. It's actually from one of the, from these strands of design we're pursuing for the canopy is actually just that. So rather than assuming it's a uniform depth, actually increase the depth in relation to <coughs> the amount of you know, stress in. You know, what, I can explain the canopy. We've got this big area 
So we soon, for example, there's a uniform plate over the area. If you analyze the plate, look at the distribution of stress, and they map the different, we map the differing uh, stresses against different depths of canopy. So you can literally just sort of come along and dive down and go back up again. So um, there probably aren't any examples in there, but we have been looking at it. And it's certainly something you should do. Also, in terms of looking at the material, not as an inert material, trying to see if you know you can use the, the forces within the material in terms of the tension or something like yeah. that. Do you have yeah. any experience with that? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Pretty stressing the materials. Is yeah. kind of weird. Kind of weird. I mean, the analysis gets pretty complicated, but that's, with velvet, a lot of the strength comes from pre stressing these kind of fiber rocks into that shape. Um, yeah, I mean, we kind of problem when you do, do pre-stress is you have to resist those forces that you put into the material. Um, so potentially you can't just kind of place the structure in the place, you need to kind of place. Not necessarily a problem, but it's a factor. Okay. Maybe following uh, Yasha's question, I think it's uh, good to just remind everyone that we'll have another presentation on Sunday, in which in ACO, in the uh, Citadel in ACO, in which we're going to present kind of the design process of the canopy. And I think there you can actually see kind of the process of how students go through uh, kind of form finding steps, how you work through the kind of local differentiation of structures. So it's, I think it's quite an interesting collaboration of an academic and, uh, environment and, and a research environment, an engineering uh, kind of design. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what do you think that uh, this way of working is mostly applied to temporary structures? And not sure. of finding a more long lasting Not at all. Not at all. Um, I think we deliberately put examples here uh, which fitted with our presentation, which is to reality, um, the, the, the actual practical making. Now, we've applied lots of these examples, these ideas to really massive projects. We're doing a, a railway station route in Italy, for example, that uses the same surface routines as the Trump Pavilion. <coughs> um, and, you know, and the way of working itself, the collaboration, the collaboration using digital tools and allowing engineers to come in at an early stage to transform design is so, so applicable to massive projects. And to be honest, I think, in, in, I'm not sure how it, how it works in Israel, how the, 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 sort of, sort of the, the climate is, but I think working with architects in the UK, it is a very collaborative process actually. Um, we do often get brought in before there's even a form or a building, and we're part of the team. So I think we, I mean, despite people saying otherwise, I think we're actually quite used to working together to create something. I think also, I mean, we'd love to be you doing urban structures. I was kind of really sad when we felt that the instruction came down. I think we're, and I, and we're, we're moving forward you know, every year and we're looking forward to doing some more instructions. I think perhaps it's the risk involved for the client, for the architect. So in all these projects, the design wasn't defined at the start and it wasn't defined really, you know, it was developing continuously. And uh, I think that's an element of risk which maybe clients aren't so happy to do on a, you know, maybe a 50 million um, hotel. But hopefully these will be proof of concept, so maybe the next project they can say, um, you know, these do work, they, they do make quite strong structures, they do make interesting looking structures. Uh, so yeah, I'm hoping this is just the first step, and uh, in a few years' time, uh, we'll have done a few discussions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We have a uh, five to ten minutes break, <coughs> and uh, we start the next presentation. Next. Okay. Thank you.